Hey, friends, I'm in the movies. Oh, yeah, I've got to talk to you about an amazing new movie you want to see. Can you hear it's me? time for the love. Your host, biblical scholar and cultural commentator, Dr. Michael Brown. Your voice for moral sanity and spiritual clarity. Call 866-34-TRUTH to get on the line of fire. And now, here's your host, Dr. Michael Brown. Welcome, welcome to the Line of Fire broadcast. Michael Brown, delighted to be with you, delighted to be with our new listeners, our old listeners. Here's what we're going to do. The first half of the broadcast... I'm going to share a bunch of things with you, but the phone lines are open. Any question you want to ask me on any subject, biblical, theological, cultural, anything you want to pick my brain on, anything you want to challenge me on where you differ, anything you want to talk about in the news, want my perspective, 866-348-7884. Then at the bottom of the hour, I'm going to be joined by producer, actor Craig Brown, talking about the brand new movie. It's going to be in about 750 movie theaters, but one night only June 20th, so a week from today, if you're listening live, June 20th, called Between Mercy and Me, and I'm I'm in the movie. I've got this little role and a couple little scenes, but my character is actually uh, uh, through the movie play, plays a role behind the scenes. But I, anyway, so it's not about me. But the fact that I'm in it is it's just it's kind of fun and unusual experience. But it's it's real it's it's a powerful movie. It's won awards for music tracks and, and other things as well. And it's gonna be one night only in the theaters. So we're gonna talk about that at the bottom of the hour. But first, your calls, any question under the sun that you wanna ask me, as we're on Live Talk Radio, 866-348-7884. Okay, I have not talked about the new indictment of of former President Trump. Uh, I did tweet a couple days ago saying that my issue is justice. Let there be equal justice for all. And in other words, if, if President Trump is guilty of certain things and should be indicted, should face charges, then just apply the law equally. In other words, how would that affect uh, former presidential candidate and Secretary of State Hillary Clinton? How would that affect current President Joe Biden? There are many who say it's a political witch hunt. That's all it is. There are many who say if this was Joe Biden, that he would not be indicted, that he's committed all these crimes, and Hillary Clinton, there were security issues with her, and she was not indicted. I I was not one in the crowd shouting, lock her up, lock her up. You never heard me lead that chant on the radio, anything like that, okay? So I don't don't know. Here, you may say, oh, it's so obvious it's a political windshield, or it's so obvious Trump is guilty. I don't know all the facts. You don't know all the facts. Our, our, our law system is still innocent to proven guilty. All I want to say is this. Whatever the case is, let the truth come to light, okay? I, I'm partisan to the truth, ultimately. I'm partisan to righteousness, ultimately, to justice, ultimately, to God's will, that's what I'm partisan to, and I do my best. Obviously, I'm far from perfect there, and, and I could fall into things like any other human being. But I do my best to have my ultimate allegiance to God. That's why I'm ultimately registered as an independent. I'm not judging you if you're registered otherwise. I'm simply saying for me, it was a matter of conscience to say I register as not a member of either party as independent, okay? That being said, my only take on it is if Trump is guilty— if there are legitimate charges brought against him, then let the truth come to light in a righteous way, as long as that same truth, that same light, that same justice is applied equally to other major figures, be it President Biden, be it Hillary Clinton. And I'm not damning them. I'm not acquitting them, any of them, any of them. And if it's a political witch hunt, let it be revealed for what it is and let it not be used against others, right? Right. Let the Department of Justice not be weaponized in a political way. That is terribly dangerous. You say, Dr. Brown, what's your opinion? I have no opinion. I have no opinion on it. You say, if, no, 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 come on. What's your opinion? I have no opinion because I do not know all the facts. I am not privy to the details. The case has not been tried yet. We don't know what the outcome is going to be. We don't know what all the evidence is. Yeah, yeah, but all the report. I haven't dug into it. It's, it's not my business and I haven't felt called or led by God to dig into it, to find out, let, let everything play out, 
but you've heard my heart, what matters to me. Just equal justice for all. That's equal treatment for all. That's my heart. That's my desire. All right? So that's my comment on it. You, you can call and talk about it, but that's, that's what I want to say. All right, let us go over to Mackay in North Carolina. Welcome to the line of fire. Hey, Dr. Brown, how you doing? Very well. Thank you, sir. Um, I had a question. I had a couple of questions. One was regarding tattoos. Mm-hmm. Um, my understanding. Whoa. Is that me? Are you talking right into the phone there, Mackay? Yes, sir. All right, go ahead. So question on tattoos. Right. From my understanding, Leviticus was, you know, an Old Testament thing, and there was other scripture. And, I mean, scripture is saying that you can't mix uh, clothing fabrics. But my question would be, when it says you can't tattoo for the dead, what if my, my mom passed away and I had a tattoo of her? Right. Okay. So the first thing is, my own view is that you have to come to your own conclusion before God on this. It's not like don't murder, don't commit adultery. You say, yeah, but it's explicit in Leviticus 19 that you're, you're not to, to get tattoo and so some kind of mourning for the dead or something like that. Uh, yes, but as you pointed out, in that section in Leviticus, contrary to, say, Leviticus 18, where God judges foreign nations for certain sexual violations, including incest and homosexual practice, etc., contrary to Leviticus 18, Leviticus 19 there are, there are laws given to Israel to keep them separate from the nations, along with universal moral principles rolled in there. And in Leviticus 19 and 20, you know, various chapters, you couldn't sow your field with two different kinds of seeds. There's nothing intrinsically wrong about that, but Israel was forbidden, forbidden for doing it because God was teaching them laws of separation. So also with tattooing, it's not to do things as the nations do. Now, I, I could not do it in good conscience. To me, it would be wrong, and I would feel that I am somehow defiling the, this, this physical body, this temple that God gave me. I couldn't do it in good conscience, but I cannot say with that one reference only, just based on Scripture, not the larger question of the origins of tattooing and the art of it and how much of it is demonic. That's a separate question, right? But as far as just basing it on that one verse in Leviticus, that's different than other prohibitions God gave Israel that also applied to all nations. As, as for the practice that's being spoken against in Leviticus 19, it's not saying that someone has a tattoo to remember someone as much as it's, it's kind of a way of mourning. It's a way of striking your body or marring your body or changing your body. So uh, if, if you're saying, should you go ahead and do it, we really have to go to the Lord and ask him his heart, his mind on it. If it's something you already have, you don't have to feel like, oh, no, I'm living in perpetual sin because I have a picture of my mom on my arm to remember her. Th- that's certainly not what the Leviticus prohibition was, was aiming at. It wasn't, it wasn't arguing against that. It was more of a pagan right and a pagan custom. So that's, that's as best as I can answer it. And from there, it's for you and the Lord to sort out, Okay. Yes, sir. Thank you. Yep. I had a, um, another question about cussing because and I've come across a lot of Christians, uh, like content creators who are Christian who, who cuss. And I yep. don't know if I asked you this question before. I might have. But they they also, um, you know, say the prophets cuss and stuff like that. Yeah, so so it's, it's okay. You know, I, I recently was told by a pastor friend of mine, former pastor, now podcaster, I guess with a, with a pretty big audience. Uh, and he says that the Holy Spirit led him to use profanity so he could reach the world better. It's like, yeah, well, why don't you weave some porn in too? You get a lot more worldly people watching if you do that. I mean, that stuff is so abhorrent and abominable and unchristian and immature and unholy. You don't become like the world to win the world. That's like you're a fitness trainer. It's like, you know what? I'm going to become really obese so I can help obese people. No, the way you can help someone who's obese is by being fit yourself and helping them to become fit. You know, I think I'm going to become an alcoholic, drink more so I can help those who are alcoholics. No, the way you can help an alcoholic is by being sober. So this, of course, is complete nonsense, and it's just an excuse for carnality. Uh, the prophets, did they, did they use profanity? No. They might talk about, for example, urinating, in, in terms that would, would be um, 
uh, you know, very direct, right? Urinating against a wall. And the King James translates it one way that we wouldn't say it today. But the, the Hebrew is there's nothing profane uh, about it. All right. Paul gives us this this guideline. Ephesians 4, 29. Let no unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. Profanity does not do that. Then Paul says, but sexual immorality, same thing, Ephesians now the fifth chapter, and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among the saints. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. So it's very clear that the words that come out of our mouths should be edifying, should be God-glorifying, should bring grace to the hearers. And the very, the very fact that certain words are recognized as profane. So what does it say profane in the Bible? Our culture recognizes words that are unacceptable. And you don't find those, use, those words used. You say, well, Philippians 3, when, when Paul's talking about, you know, uh, all my righteousness is just, just like dung. It's more like C-R-A-P. And, oh, okay. Even if you go there, he's not using profanity, all right? It's, it's very, very different. And that's why everything I'm saying on the air right now, we could air on primetime TV or ch- uh, daytime TV for children, and nothing would be bleeped out. But if I was using profanity, it would be bleeped out. There are cultural things that are recognized. So let nothing unwholesome proceed from your mouth. But, but that which is going to minister grace to the hearers. Uh, it's just, all this is just an excuse for carnality. People say, oh, I'm going to show how spiritual. See, I'm spiritual, but not religious. And they'll, they'll, in the middle of worship, drop some profane thing or after worship sit around and drop f-bombs all that is is carnality from people whose lives are not fully right with god and are not walking in holiness it is that simple it does not glorify the lord it is an outlet for the flesh and it is ultimately destructive it does not help anybody draw closer to jesus hope that's plain enough we'll be right back Chronic inflammation is the greatest health threat to humanity. Infections, injuries, toxins, poor diet, and chronic stress can attack your immune system and lead to chronic inflammation. But now there's a solution you can fight this dangerous silent killer with. Nopalea, made from the superfruit of the Nepal cactus, containing a unique group of bioflavonoids clinically shown to reduce chronic inflammation. In a random, double-blind, placebo-controlled study, it showed a reduction of elevated, at-risk C-reactive protein levels, resulting in an improvement in range of motion in the back, neck, and joints, and an overall improvement in the quality of life. Nopalea has helped thousands of people by lowering levels of chronic inflammation. Let's hear what customers are saying. I'm a personal trainer and owner of three gyms. Super excited, doing a renovation in here, bringing new equipment in. And as I was bringing the new equipment in, I was trying to move a piece. I moved, the equipment didn't move, and I injured myself severely. So it was frustrating. It was, it was really depressing. I wasn't able to work out. I wasn't able to train. I wasn't able to do just normal daily functions. After taking Nopal A, I found that it really helped with my recovery, not only with my severe injury in my back, but it also helped in my recovery of my workouts. Nopalea has helped thousands of people by lowering levels of chronic inflammation. To place your order, call 800-771-5584 or online at trivita.com. As a new customer introductory offer, use promo code BROWN25 for a 25% discount on your purchase of Nopalea. And 100% of your first order will go to the support of Line of Fire. Go to Trivita.com or call 800-771-5584. Again, 800-771-5584. 
5584. It's the Line of Fire with your host, Dr. Michael Brown. Get on the Line of Fire by calling 866-34-TRUTH. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. So uh, last night, I went to hang out with one of my best friends in the world, and I, I brought with him uh, a case, a container of nitric oxide for one month. I gave it to him for free. I said, check this out, man. Uh, do it every day. See the results you get after a few weeks because I've, I've been blessed by these Trivita supplements. So if you've never tried out the nitric oxide or no Pelea, you just heard about, I use them. They've enhanced my life, and we recommend them to you. And then again, it's a great way for you to support the ministry uh, because 100% of your first order is donated to the line of fire and over a tithe of all subsequent orders. So call 800-771-5584. Tell them Dr. Brown sent you or go to Trivita.com. Be sure to use the code BROWN25. All right, let's go back to the phones. Alex in Orlando, Florida, welcome to the line of fire. Uh, hey, Dr. Brown, uh, God bless you. Um, I got a question. Um, so I'm part of uh, a ministry, uh, CFM, and um, we're, we're very zealous for the word, um, but, um, you know, there's a, a little bit of a division, and it, it not, it's not the major, but, you know, we are uh, kind of in discussion about the, the name of Jesus in Hebrew, uh-huh. um, you know, and I've listened to some of your teachings on it, um, and... But one of the guys, one of the gentlemen holds to Yahshua, Y-A-H-Shua. And, um, and I've showed him your teachings on it, and uh, he says he just doesn't trust you and your teachings on it because of uh, there was supposedly a revival of the Hebrew language in the early 1900s, late 1800s. And so he says that the, uh, the Hebrew language was lost. For, nonsense. You know, I guess, close to 100% you know, complete nonsense. One million percent okay. complete nonsense. The Hebrew language has been used continuously for thousands of years. It has been used daily in prayer. It has been used daily in study of scripture. It has been used daily in scriptural commentary uh, and on and on in the religious Jewish community for centuries. What was revived was spoken Hebrew. Spoken Hebrew as a language that you just chat about, like, what did you watch in sports last night? Or what do you want to have for dinner? Or kids, you need to be quiet, you know, it's bedtime. Spoken Hebrew was revived at the turn of the last century, especially under the leadership of Eliezer ben Yehuda. All right? But Hebrew, in terms of, of the language itself, was called the Shon HaKodesh in, in, Hebrew, in, in Hebrew, the Holy, the Holy Tongue, has been actively used, studied, there's literature that's been written for centuries and centuries, poetry and commentary. I mean, I, if, if we went from my studio here, 10 feet or 20 feet across the hall to my study, I'd show you all kinds of Hebrew books that have been written over the centuries, a thousand years ago, 500 years ago, 2000 years ago. It, it has never stopped being used every single day by large numbers of Jews around the world. It just wasn't a common spoken language uh, like, like we'd be speaking, you know, back and forth today, just in conversation. So any, anyone, anyone who knows anything about Hebrew whatsoever knows that to be true. This is not dispute. This is not, this is not anyone, this is not a theory I just gave you. As surely as there's a country called the United States of America, everything I just told you about Hebrew is known to anyone who knows anything at all, uh, with any accuracy about Hebrew. That's number one. Number two, we know for sure the ancient pronunciation was not Yahshua. And we know it from ancient sources. I can be one million percent sure of that as well. How do we know it? Well, we know it because all of the Hebrew vocalization that we have, right, which reflects earlier traditions going back to biblical days, vocalizes the equivalent Hebrew name in the Old Testament, used about 30 times for eight or nine different people as Yeshua, right? Not Yahshua, but Yeshua, that's the first thing. The second thing, the Greek, the Septuagint, when it translated that, and in the same way in the Greek New Testament, so the thousands of manuscripts we have of the Greek New Testament, they all say Jesus. Now, if, the, if it was pronounced Yah, then, then instead of the, the uh, Greek having Eoda, Eta, the, the Greek would have had Eoda, Alpha. And you, you have words with Yah, like Yavne, for example, a place called Yavne. You have names like that in the Hebrew Bible, 
And when they are transliterated into Greek, they're transliterated as ya, ya, as opposed to ye, right? So the Greek transliteration is telling you, and the Greek name Jesus is telling you it was not ya. And then the ancient Syriac has two different pronunciations of Jesus, both of which would reflect the, the ye sound, not the ya sound. So we know without any question that it was not Yah. We also know that Yeshua is short for Yehoshua, right? So the, the Yah, right. you do not have Yah as, as the divine name, the divine particle at the beginning of a Hebrew name. That's not the way it went. You might have had uh, Yahu, right? So Yahweh shortened and then, you, then it becoming Yeho, you'd have something like that. So Yehoshua, but you, you did not have a name Yahshua anywhere in ancient history, anywhere in the Hebrew Bible, to my knowledge, anywhere in the history of the Hebrew language. It is people, you will not find a single academic source in the world, a solid recognized academic source, or a solid recognized Hebrew scholar arguing for an ancient pronunciation of Yahshua. The only argument that you'll have among some rabbinic Jews and, and some Hebrew philologians is whether in the first century the final ah was, was clearly heard. It's what's called um, a glottal stop or a non-syllabic glide vowel. So Yeshua was it originally, uh, at the time of Jesus, was it clearly pronounced Yeshua or was it simply pronounced Yeshua and, and the final ayin ended there? That's the only debate, and most agree it was Yeshua with that final ah sound. But no argument that the beginning was not Yah. I actually almost started to write on this the other day, just quite randomly, that it's not Yeshua, because somebody probably posted it and I saw it again. So hopefully your friend has the humility to recognize that he's completely in error uh, when it comes to, to the history of the Hebrew language, and that I'm not basing this on modern Hebrew. Uh, I'm basing this on ancient Hebrew. I'm basing this on all the Hebrew texts and manuscripts that we have. I'm basing this on the Greek transliteration of the Hebrew Bible. I'm basing this on the Greek New Testament. I'm basing this on the Syriac translation of Peshitta. It's not ambiguous. It's not debated. There is no such name as Yahshua. And if people want truth, look, you can mispronounce it and God still knows uh, who you're talking about. You can butcher the name and God's not going to not answer your prayer because you butchered the name. But why not get it right since we have the information? And by the way, Yeshua in, in Hebrew becomes Jesus. In Greek, there is no sh sound in Greek, right? So Shlomo, right, which is the Hebrew name for Solomon. The sh Shlomo becomes Solomon. Shaul becomes Saul. Right, because there, there is no SH sound in Hebrew. So when you take the Hebrew Yeshua, then go from there into Greek, and Greek into Latin, and then ultimately into English, Jesus is the way we say it in English. So that's perfectly fine as well. Jesu in Italian, Jesus in, in Spanish, in various other ways. Thankfully, God knows who we are talking about. There is no ambiguity here. This is not a matter of, well, it could be this, it could be that. Well, that's the case to tell you. I'll tell you, you know, here's one position, here's another. I could go either way with it. No, no, not, not here. So, so ho hopefully people will just give up this Yahshua nonsense or what other silly names they have. If you want to call him Joshua in full, Yehoshua as the full name, you know, that... That's not erroneous. He wouldn't have been known by that, but that's just the full name. But if, if I was identified as Mike and people called me Michael, it would be kind of an equivalent there. Anyway, say goodbye to the myth of Yahshua. God knows it's a myth. Yeshua knows it's a myth. Why propagate a myth? It does you no good. All right, I've got a special guest coming on. If I have time, I may get to a few more calls. If you want to stick around, fine. Otherwise, we'll take some more calls beginning of the show tomorrow. We've got another special guest coming right. We come back, Craig Brown. We're going to talk about the new movie between Mercy and me.
Hey friends, this is Dr. Michael Brown. I want to invite you to join our support team, make an investment of $1 a day that will absolutely last forever. You know, the Lord has given us a holy mandate to blanket America with the line of fire broadcast. And on a regular basis, we hear from folks writing in, Dr. Brown, I used to be a practicing homosexual. I listened to you. I heard grace and truth together. I was changed. We hear from pastors who say, thank you for speaking with compassion, but giving us backbone and courage. And we know across America, so many believers are getting healthy and strong through listening to the broadcast, through listening to these messages as we, we tackle the controversies, the most difficult issues of the day. We even hear from former Muslims who've come to faith, from Jewish people who now believe in Jesus, Yeshua, the Messiah, through this broadcast and our resources. So join our support team. One dollar or more per day makes you an official torchbearer. Immediately, you will get access to hundreds of hours of terrific online classes and exclusive video content. Every single month, we'll send you a brand new audio message and along with it, an insider prayer newsletter where we'll talk about the things that are going to be coming in our ministry and share some of the amazing testimonies of the fruit that you are a part of. And when you do sign up, I want to give you two books as a special gift. First, Compassionate Father or Consuming Fire. Who is the God of the Old Testament? I, I take the best of my Hebrew and Old Testament scholarship, wrap it together in this book that you'll find eye-opening, answering many of the questions you have. And then Revolution, my classic book that tells you how to wage war the Jesus way, overcoming evil with good, overcoming hatred with love. We are transformed. We can bring transformation to the nation. So call this number now, 800-538-5275. That's 800 800- 538-5275, say, I'd like to become a torchbearer, or go to askdrbrown.org. Click on Donate Monthly Support. It's the Line of Fire with your host, Dr. Michael Brown. Get on the Line of Fire by calling 866-34-TRUTH. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. So I, I've been getting texts from friends, got a text from our older daughter the other day, and Older daughter said, Dad, is that you in the movies? One of her friends was in a movie theater and watching movie previews, and she texted Jen. Her older daughter said, Jen, is that your dad? And uh, then got a text from some other friends, and, and they'd taken a screenshot. They said, Doc, was that, was that you? So I, I, I've, got a, I've got a little role here in this amazing movie between Mercy and me. That is coming out one week from tonight. So if you're listening live, it's one week from today, June 20th. It's going to be in 750 theaters. I found one about 20 minutes from my house myself. So we want to tell you about it. We want to tell you how you can be part of it and why it is so important. And now the producer, one of the actors in the movie, Craig Brown. Hey, Craig, welcome back to The Line of Fire. Dr. Brown, how's it going? I'm glad to be here. And oh. I'm glad to hear of your uh, your new fame in the movie theater. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Thanks for allowing me to play a part in, in such an important movie. Uh, Craig, let's first talk about you and your wife, Brown and Brown, and how that ties in with the very theme of this movie. Yeah, yeah. My yeah, my wife, Caitlin, uh, the, the name of my uh, production company is the Brown Brown Films. And uh, so Caitlin was, uh, her, her her maiden name is Brown. So when we got married, her name didn't change. So uh, she just hyphenated said Brown Brown in all of her like uh, you know social media pages and stuff. So uh, I just kind of took the name and ran away with it. Uh, but yeah, yeah. Uh, so that's uh, the name Brown Brown. And um, yeah, and and over the, uh, you know, the past uh, you know couple of years, we're you know wor- working on movies and uh, writing and. Um, in the midst of 2020, uh, in the midst of like you know, the chaos with uh, COVID and um, you know the death of George Floyd, uh, I, mean, I-, I could clearly see that there is like a disconnect uh, on how to have a healthy conversation about uh, racial unity. And uh, from there, uh, this movie was born. Uh, I thought the best way to tackle uh, you know such a heavy conversation was uh, through um, a love story uh, that was paired with uh, a great music. Uh, soundtrack and uh, which is like a, the backbone of uh, the film. So yeah, and and the reason that you might have a little knowledge about having difficult conversations about race in the church is because you and your wife are an interracial couple. 
Correct, correct. Yeah, so the the movie is played by our two leads, uh, uh, and, and Andrea Summer and David Driscoll, uh, who are black and white. And uh, I, yeah, my, my wife is white, and uh, I uh, was, uh, although, although my story is kind of different than the two leads, uh, mm-hmm. however, um, I can definitely, uh, you know, feel the, uh, the tension of, you know, being in a, uh, Generational um, marriage and uh, what that plays uh, out in society. Uh, however, uh, like my my wife's parents are fantastic. Uh, however, uh, the rest of the culture, uh, you know, could you know find some challenges with it as well and having interracial children and stuff. So yeah, I, I was able to take some 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 of my own experiences, uh, but mostly uh, this story uh, really looks at uh, the church. Uh, when, when it comes to uh, racial division and uh, how uh, we need to play a part. Yeah, and, and the fact is, for the most part, Craig, we're kind of like ships passing each other in the night and either unaware of, of one another's positions or each one thinking, well, I'm right or you're missing something. Mm-hmm. And, and we, we often don't get into one another's worlds. So the movie Friends Between Mercy and Me uh, so uh, two two worship leaders, singers, a white gal, black guy, and build a relationship. But then this tension and this misunderstanding, and it's clear that, hey, you don't get what's happening in my world kind of thing. It happens a lot more than we realize, and it can happen right within the church. So so this, you know, the, the movie really is an honest movie. It, it really is a slice of... Of, of what's happening, a picture of what's happening in in America today, but it's a movie with hope as well. So let, let's first talk before we get into some of the the plot and and why mm-hmm. why it's important, why you put this out, and and why we want everyone to go see this movie. But first, the the music, as you said, drives it. You even won won an award with the music, didn't you? Yeah, yeah. So. It- um, won Best Musical Soundtrack at the International Christian Film Festival uh, last year and uh, some uh, other uh, festival awards uh, in regards to the music as well, yeah. Right, so so the the lead actors both both sing, both play, mm-hmm. and this is this is newly written music for the movie, yes? Yes, yes. So every piece of music that you hear in this film has been specifically crafted for the story, so it's all original music, and is is probably one of the things I'm most proud of. It is amazing, it's powerful, um, and this was uh, done by uh, Andrea Summer and David Driscoll, uh, who were, um, you know, just uh, just amazing talents to have contribute uh, to the soundtrack and to the story. And it was, uh, and we also had a a lot of other um, musicians collaborate as well, and that even includes uh, Grammy-nominated uh, recording artists. Uh, so yeah, I mean, it, it was. I, I, I knew that the music had to be the thing that uh, was, you know, excellent, um, but also that was ingrained within the story. So yes, yeah, this is a brand new album, twenty original songs uh, that are uh, stellar and very catchy. Yeah, and I'm just some of the melodies going through my mind as 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 I'm sitting here talking to you because they really do stay with you. So that carries the movie, you, you know, the, the the narrative, the interaction, the 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 tense things that build up, some of the, the crisis within the movie. How's it going to be resolved? It's really carried by the music, and it's it's amazing that these gifts were used for this musical production, uh, for for this for this movie, and. Uh, there's some other awards you you won as well, not just for music, but some other awards that the movie won. Correct? Yeah, yeah. It, w- it also uh, won a best screenplay at the New York Movie Awards, and um, there is also some other festivals where we've taken home uh, best musical soundtrack or uh, best uh, feature film or screenplay. And and as yeah, you um, as you've had other folks watch it from varied perspectives. Have they told you that it, it, it struck them as real? That this, like, hey, this is the world we live in. This is the conversation we need to have. Have you gotten that kind of feedback? Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. So um, there's been quite a few people who have seen this movie who are uh, leaders within a church who sat down and screened the whole movie. 
uh, for whether it's just uh, to, hey, give them to present to their church or for endorsements. And, like, these leaders have had uh, amazing things to say about the film because of the issue that it tackles and how it tackles. Uh, a lot of times with, uh, you know, when race is touched, um, it's, you know, kind of done in a, a harmful way. Um, there's, like, no goal of unity at the end. It's just uh, presented just to get a point across. Um, like, that's not this film. Uh, it was it was uh, done very uh, with, with the intentions to bring uh, people together. And so that's been the response of, you know, uh, leaders who sat down to watch this movie and want to take it to their congregations and use it as a ministry tool to help uh, inspire uh, conversations around racial unity. Yeah, you know, it's it's an interesting thing, Craig. Let's say you have a, a tragedy like the, the killing of George Floyd, and then you'll have, say, maybe white conservatives say, look, statistically, and they'll start going through statistics and say, statistically, it's more likely that a black man will be killed by a black cop. Now, statistically, people are not being singled out, and, and they'll go through all that. And, and then you'll have a black person say, you just don't get it. You don't know what we've lived through. You don't know our history. And we don't even trust a lot of the stats because who controls the stats? And we just pass each other in, instead yeah. of first saying, OK, what I, what I want to know is, so the, 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 the killing of George Floyd and the sentencing of the, of the different cops involved in, in what was judged to be his murder. So what I want to find out first is, OK, forget that the race baiters and the activists trying to stir up trouble and Antifa and all. Forget, forget that. Radical elements of black life. Matter, forget that. I want to find out why this is so traumatic for my black friend. Like, well, why is this such a, a fresh wound, mm -hmm. an open wound for you? Why is it like you feel like that was your uncle or your father or your brother that that happened to? Rather than, well, I've got all the statistics here, you know? And yeah, yeah. Right. But but often we, we never get that far, you know, or just callers. One of my friends, a dear black friend, he says to me, Mike, there's not a racist bone in your body, but there's a lot you don't know. So, well, talk to me. Fill me in. You know, I've never been racially profiled. <laughs> yeah. I've never had certain experiences. Right. Then on mm -hmm. the other hand, it's like, hey, this is real. But but perhaps things are being exaggerated in your own perception. You know, so you first have to listen, understand and then have an mm -hmm. honest conversation. Hey, let me, sh now that I heard your perspective, can I share my perspective? And let's see yeah. where we're missing each other because ultimately we're, we're called to be one in the Lord and we know it's Satan who divides. So this movie is, because it's a love story, it's kind of raw. It kind of, you struggle as the, as the relationship gets tense. And uh, it, is, it is a conversation starter, which is a key reason uh, you put it out. So, so Craig, uh, I had had you on the air previously for a movie that you were in, and you contacted me one day. You had my, my personal contact info. You said, hey, Dr. Brown, I, I, I put out a movie, and I, I, got a, I got a role for you to play. It was, it, was, it was quite a surprise to get the call and chat with you. But uh, who, is, who is Harold? I mean, who, who, is this, who is this guy that I play? In the, again, it's a, it's a tiny little role, but the story is kind of weaved through the whole thing. So the, the others are the stars. I just get this little, little thing in here. But uh, why is Harold important? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Harold is a very important part to the story, even though it's, uh, you know, uh, a small uh, role, uh, you know, dialogue-wise, right. but is very crucial to the story. And the hero uh, is, a, is a is a bridge builder. Uh, he's someone who's known um, both by black and white people who uh, love him within the community, and he's a he's a pillar in the community. And uh, yeah, the, the best way to describe uh, uh, hero is you know someone who um, looks at uh, what scripture says about unity and uh, that we are to um, first um, love God with our whole heart, soul, and mind and love our neighbor. And I think uh, Harold embodies that and it's no secret uh, whatsoever. So, yeah, I, he, he was uh, the funnest character to dream up. Uh, 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 cool. Start <laughs> yeah. here. We'll, we'll be right back. I want to tell you more about this movie subject of gentrification comes in as well, which is interesting. And then I want to tell you how you can find out where you can see it. Bring a bunch of friends with you June 20th between Mercy and me. All right, I'll be right back with Craig Brown.
Nopalea has helped thousands of people by lowering levels of chronic inflammation. I really enjoy being physical. It's something I've just always loved, but I've definitely had times where it's really crippled me up. Being a horse trainer can be pretty physically demanding with all the duties that I have, not just riding horses for a living, saddling horses, caring for the horses. I feel like no playa just took the edge off and then it's it's continued to keep me more no playa it's been a huge blessing. Now there's a solution by lowering levels of chronic inflammation. Nopalea, made from the superfruit of the Nepal cactus, containing a unique group of bioflavonoids clinically shown to reduce chronic inflammation. In a random, double-blind, placebo-controlled study, it showed a reduction of elevated at-risk C-reactive protein levels, resulting in an improvement in range of motion in the back, neck, and joints, and an overall improvement in the quality of life. It's fun to be on the golf course again. I'm able to swing the club freely. Hopefully, I'm hitting better golf shots. No play has allowed me to get back on the golf course, enjoy the game that I love, and maybe even give me that little edge to beat my friends at the game. Nopalea has helped thousands of people by lowering levels of chronic inflammation. To place your order, call 800-771-5584 or online at trivita.com. As a new customer introductory offer, use promo code BROWN25 for a 25% discount on your purchase of Nopalea. And 100% of your first order will go to the support of Line of Fire. Go to Trivita.com or call 800-771-5584. Again, 800-771-5584. It's the Line of Fire with your host, Dr. Michael Brown. Get on the Line of Fire by calling 866-34-TRUTH. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. The new movie, Between Mercy and Me, will be in 750 theaters through Fathom Events, June 20th. All right, I'm on with Craig Brown, producer of the movie, and also uh, in the movie himself. Uh, Craig how can people see this in the theaters on June 20th? Yeah, so uh, first, buy your ticket. Uh, so if you go to fathomevents.com and uh, search between Mercy and me, um, and there you can enter your zip code and you can uh, you know, search theaters in your area that may be hosting the movie. Or you can go to our website, uh, betweenmercyandme.com, and uh, just click uh, tickets and you can do the same thing there as well. Actually, I think it redirects you, but however, uh, you go to either of those sites uh, and you'll be able to purchase purchase your tickets. Uh, it's one day only on June 20th, uh, and this is definitely a film you want to experience in the theaters with the soundtrack that we produce. It's made uh, <laughs> to be a witness in the theater, uh, and also with it's just better to watch with a big group of people as we witness. Yeah, and if, if you go to betweenmercyandme.com, you can watch the trailer. Get a little taste of the music, of the movie. Uh, I'm in there for about a, a two seconds as well. Uh, and, uh, but but uh, check it out. And then June 20th in the theaters. Yeah, you know, I hadn't even thought of, the, I, I think of the big screen. I hadn't even thought about the, the music on the big screen and, and with that sound system. So absolutely the place to be. So the... The issue of gentrification, what exactly is that, and, and why is that an issue that, that often brings up some racial tension? Yeah, yeah, I thought it would be, <laughs> so what I would say, like writing a movie about race is extremely difficult. <laughs> uh, however, um, I thought that uh, gentrification would be uh, a good topic to touch on because um, like it is something that can be uh, divisive. So, like you have you have two things going on. You have one uh, people who live in you know impoverished or uh, you know areas where there's low income. Um, um, you know, maybe the area isn't as nice. And then uh, as soon as you know more infrastructure comes in, rents get raised, and um, a lot of the people who don't own homes are kind of left. Like, okay, where do I go now? Um, so that's uh, the real 
part of it. And like, I've, I've witnessed it. I've, grew, I've grown up in inner city of Detroit. Uh, I've, I've, I've seen it uh, here in Cincinnati. Um, and then, then there's other part of like, all right, how do we, uh, you know, do this in a way that doesn't, um, you know, totally just displace people and we continue the cycle. And I think sometimes, uh, you know, in the world and politics in, in general, um, you know, we, we just look at uh, what's going on and say, oh, okay, you know, it, it, it's, it's legal, uh, therefore um, we can uh, do it. But however, I think that's something that also deserves a conversation, not that revitalization in its nature is harmful, uh, I think there's just uh, you know better ways to go about it to uh, ensure that um, you know there's you know, to consider the people in those areas. Uh, so you can see the tension with uh, this in the story, but also it challenges all of us. How do we respond in moments uh, like this where we feel um, you know threatened, or how do we respond in moments if you're a white person if you if you've been labeled a racist because of your that it's like how do you how do we respond and uh, that's what I was that was the point of it and as as a as a writer and director as I wanted people to think like what should your response be in these moments? Yeah, and and you play an important role in this. So so the two stars of the movie Hugo and Mercy, uh, they do a great job. And in, in fact, the the one scene where I interact with both of them, and Hugo's a little upset with me and and. You know, we're getting ready to, to, you know, you go through it multiple times, you know, from different angles and, and all of this, going through the lines and deliver them differently, et cetera, as, as you do in, in, in a movie set. And because he's he's upset, he's, you know, because of my you know, my particular stance that I have. And I kept feeling like he's mad at me. But before we would start the scene, I'm like, <laughs> why is he mad at me? So, okay, he's because he's about to be acting. Because we're sitting, it's like he looks mad. It's like yeah, he's he's mulling this over. You know, he's he's in the, he's in the role in, in the moment. But but as as you goes older, uh, as you as brother, you're, you're not particularly happy with career choices he makes. But you're not particularly happy with him dating this this white girl, and and you you, you speak up about it. You know, your your mom in the movie is mm-hmm. trying to be more moderate and, and so on. But. Um, you, you know, you you carry that well. Uh, obviously, you've you've heard these kinds of things on both sides of interracial relations. Maybe not in your own life, yeah. but but others. Yeah. These are very real issues. To this, strangely, to this day in America, these are still issues. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It it, it was a, it was fun playing that character because, it, like you said, like I, I I've heard both sides, and uh, the, the the character I play, he's I would say. I would say he's a bad guy, but he's definitely not likable uh, when <laughs> you first meet him, all right? Um, but, and, and that's what I wanted to do. I wanted people to uh, kind of, like, hear, uh, you know, so, some of the things that these characters are saying in the movie. Uh, I wanted them to hear that and then kind of reflect, like, oh, I've said this thing, and this is how this person can feel in this moment, um, because I think the narrative can be sometimes that you know i've i've heard it said like you know black people can't be racist because <laughs> because of the obvious uh our, our obvious history right but that's not true like i can be, i can be hateful i can isolate someone who's white and make them feel less than i can make them feel uh i i can i can label them as a racist um but that that's not okay that and and in like that's that's not the truth so, um, you know, and, and that was a point of, you know, uh, this character in particular, someone who's black and very proud and, and may be a little racist himself, is that, like, we're not without sin. Um, so, and, and that was, like, kind of the approach of the film. It's like, I wanted it to be balanced, mm-hmm. but I also wanted it to tell truth so that we can get to a place where we can have a more productive uh movement in regards to uh, a racial unity. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, Craig, uh, the Jesus Revolution movie that came out, uh, the story of Greg Laurie and, and what happened in Jesus Revolution, Lonnie Frisbee and stuff, I was reading the producers were talking about it and they said, hey, we basically made a movie that people would want to see because we told stories about people that you get interested in. I'm paraphrasing what they said. In other words, it wasn't like we have a message we want to get across. It's like we want a movie that's going to 
interest you and draw you in and, and get you involved with people. So you, you want to know about these people. You want to follow this. So by making this a love story that gets challenged, and I'm, I'm not giving a spoiler uh, alert because I'm not going to reveal what ends up happening, good or bad, but you, you, you want to see, see the racial misunderstandings overcome because it seems like this couple is supposed to be together. And, and that's really God's heart. When you step, we can talk about abstract issues, but when you have a couple and a relationship that breaks down because of misunderstanding and racial tension, you know, it's, it's not supposed to be like that. And then mm -hmm. that's kind of a yeah. microcosm of the body. So emotionally, you want, you want it to work, which means, okay, we have to have the conversations then. And we have to be honest with each other and we have to help one another see each other's blind spots so that we can have God's heart. And that's what I believe the, the movie does emotionally in a good way, because you, you identify either both sides or one side or the other with, with Hugo, with Mercy, with the families, with the churches. It's like, I, I, I want to see this work. And that's God's <laughs> heart for his people, yeah. right? Yeah, 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 I was, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, that was the, that was the main goal uh, as I was, you know, spending uh, many, 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 many late nights writing it. Like, you know, just asking God, like, how... How do we make this accessible? How do we make this uh, film uh, resonate with uh, the church, the big big C church, like uh, in, in regards to uh, you know this this topic? So uh, yeah, yeah, no, that was my hope um, in each scene uh, is that you know we could see ourselves in these positions, but also that we could uh, also see the beauty that can come when we choose to. Uh, you know, fight for um, love, and and, yeah. and that's that's the love story part of this. They're fighting for love. Yeah, and it's love that ultimately is God's heart, and that calls us mm -hmm. to unite. And Jesus says that the world will know you're my disciples when you mm -hmm. love one another. You have love one yeah. for another. So go to either fathomevents.com and then search for Between Mercy and Me. Go ahead and buy your tickets. We did an e-blast to, to uh, our uh, email list. We've been posting on social media, get the word out. Or go to Between Mercy and Me. So you go and Mercy, that's the couple involved. Between Mercy and Me. Go there, check out the trailer. I think it'll get your interest. Look for a theater near you, 750 theaters across America. One night only, June 20th, Between Mercy and Me dot com. Check it out, and I'll I'll be there. Oh, I I play a little role, but oh, something happens to me that's pretty rough. Uh, yeah, you'll you'll have to go see it yourself, and uh, it's a captivating ending as well. Hey, Craig, thanks for allowing me to be part of this. It, it was a real honor and joy, and uh, pray for great great success on on the movie on June twentieth. God bless you, brother. Absolutely, God bless you as well. Thank you. All right. Yeah, you, you heard it first, and you heard it loudly and clearly. Hey, don't forget to give you great resources during what is called Pride Month. My book, Can You Be Gay and Christian? Super important read for you, critically important read. And you get it for free when you get the book, My Debate with Rabbi Shmuley about homosexuality in America. Call 800-538-5275, 800 53, excuse me, 538-5275.